I'm here on behalf of Dr. Courtney Allen, who is the coordinator of the faculty lecture series. And she had a class tonight, so she asked me to fill in for her for the introductions. And this is the last um, lecture in the series for this, this year. And it will resume in the fall, so stay tuned. But we're really lucky tonight to have um, a, a very timely presentation that was purposefully timed with the Adam State production of Good Kids. And if you haven't seen it yet, you still have this weekend to see it, which is about the Steubenville rape case. And this um, presentation tonight is going to allow us to explore some of the issues related to that. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Stephanie Hillwood from the Department of Sociology to share with us her expertise on rape culture and how we're all a part of creating this. So please join me in welcoming her this evening. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie Hillwig. Uh, I teach in the sociology department. So these are some of the issues I talk about anyways in uh, my uh, intro class and some of my other um, sociology class. So we're going to be talking, really not we're going to be talking about rape or rape myths. We're really going to be taking, uh, talking about uh, rape culture, really sort of the things we all do in our culture um, that sort of create um, a situation where rape thrives, where rape is easier to happen, and sometimes we don't even know or recognize when it's happening. So it's not um, really about rape culture per se, or the rape myths, you know, what do people believe, you know, who are uh, prone to rape, um, but it's the ways we accept all of those subtle messages that make it easy for rapists to exist and to justify their actions. Um, so it's these ideas that women's bodies really aren't private property. Women's bodies are public property for us to scrutinize, to judge, um, and as we treat women as property, of course, we can do what we want to property. And so we, these subtle messages. So here's the analogy of what this, um, this sort of talk is going to be about. So let's pretend we're biologists and we're going to study plants and fungi. Well, we could study the characteristics of those plants, of that fungus. We could study how it processes food, um, the soil, the air, these sorts of things, sun. We could discuss its life so cycle. Um, and so we could discuss all of those aspects of it. But at some point, we need to talk about what kind of environment does that plant grow best? What kind of environment does that fungi grow best? So whether there's a lot of sunlight or does it need more shade, how much water, humidity in the air, does it grow best in that environment? What kind of soil nurtures it the most? Um, what temperatures needed for it to be? So this is sort of the analogy. We're not going to be talking about the plant. We're not going to be talking about rape. We're going to be talking about the environment and who's the environment in which, which rape thrives. That's us. That's all of us. That's all of the things that um, we do. So that's what we'll be talking about uh, in this particular um, talk. So I know you guys have, how many people have seen the play? Has anyone seen the play? So a couple of people. I encourage you to see it. That's based on a real situation. Uh, but let me tell you just very briefly about a couple of um, other cases very similar to that. How many people are familiar with Kitty Genovese? A few of you, all my students should be familiar with her. Uh, in this case, and it's somewhat uh, misleading what, hap uh, what happened here, but this is her, but this was the 1960s, um, and she was raped, and there were about 38 witnesses who heard her screams, who heard her cries, knew she was being attacked, didn't report it to the police, uh, and didn't come out and help her and saved her. Uh, the rape lasted, so she was raped and murdered, and the attack lasted about 30 to 40 minutes, in which nobody did anything. Um, and many of the people said, well, we thought it was a lover's quarrel, or uh, we just heard her screaming. We didn't know she was being raped or murdered or attacked. We just knew she was screaming. We thought people were fighting or something. But they knew a woman was in danger. They knew a woman was. Uh, 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 screaming for help, nobody came to help her. Uh, another case 
in 2009, this one um, received some national attention, but not as much. In this particular case, it was a 15-year-old girl leaving a homecoming dance in Richmond, California. Uh, while she was leaving with the dance, she had been drinking. Some boys lured her into the back of the, the, behind the auditorium where the dance was to another part of campus. And there, there were as many as um, a dozen attackers and 20 witnesses who raped her, beat her, uh, completely unconscious in an attack that lasted over two hours. Uh, students were coming back watching the attack, taking pictures on their phones and sending them to each other. Nobody called the police. Two hours after the attack, she was lying there almost dead underneath a park bench. A girl at home receives, a her boyfriend receives one of the texts, oh, check this out. She sees it, she immediately, without even going to the school, calls the police. Uh, the police arrive, she's taken to the ICU because she's almost dead at this point. Uh, they did bring all the witnesses who were watching this into the police the next day uh, but in California, there was no legal um, ability to file charges against any of the witnesses because in California, the law is if a victim is 14 years or younger, you have to call the police if they're being attacked. If they're 15 and older, you, there's no legal obligation. She was 15 years old. Uh, so they couldn't do anything in that case. And then, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with this one, the Facebook Live Rape. Did anybody hear about this one? March of 2016, so about one year ago today. In this one, there were six attackers. One 15-year-old girl um, raped her, lured her into a house, raped her, and posted it live on Facebook. They know of about 40 people who witnessed it live on Facebook. None of them called the police. It wasn't until a relative of the girls a day or two later um, saw uh, the image contacted her parent uh, and the parents contacted the police. So it didn't even happen for a day or two later. What links all of these cases? All of these cases were situations where a young girl was raped in front of an audience. An audience watched all of these things, but here's the interesting thing. The audience, in some of the cases, didn't even recognize that a rape was happening. It didn't even recognize to them. They had their story in their head of what a rape looks like, and they didn't even recognize it. They didn't report it. It didn't occur to them, ah, this is a crime. Somebody is being badly hurt. We should do something about it. Um, and so the question is, is why can people watch a rape happen, a brutal rape where girls almost die, do die, and not even notice, not even call the police? Um, uh, so this is a quote from a study that looked at, uh, in the 1980s, actually by a woman of San Day, uh, looked at um, about uh, 156 tribal societies around the world, and she wanted to say, and she, she wanted to say what is happening in which some societies rape is happening more commonly than other societies. Because at the time in the 1980s, people were saying, ah, oh, it's just human nature. It's just what happens in every society around the world. Men rape women. It's just as old as human existence. She wanted to see if this was true. So she studies 156 societies and that she found that there was huge variations in how often rape was occurring. That there were some societies which she identified as rape prone societies. There was about um, 18 of them, 18% uh, of them, where, where rape was actually common. Abuse of women was actually very common. There was about 30 something percent of these societies where rape was relatively, um, where the society was relatively rape free, meaning it was virtually unheard of. It didn't occur to anybody for it to happen. Very few women experienced it. Um, essentially, nobody understood. And then societies that fell somewhere uh, in the middle. And so she looked at what were the structural differences of these rape free societies versus these rape 
rape-prone societies. Uh, and she found that in rape-prone societies, there was a, um, more endorsement of a macho personality, meaning masculinity and masculinity identified with being tough and brave uh, was uh, associated with this, so accepting a physical aggression, high risk-taking behavior among men, casual attitudes towards sex among men, um, and more agreement in the belief of the inferiority of females. Um, and what we notice in these um, societies with high amounts of rape is women had lower status and violence against women in general is more common. So you find more spousal abuse, you find more violence against women. So, probably wondering, what does this look like? So, you, many of you guys may have seen this video. Has anybody ever seen the video of a woman walking through New York being catcalled? So if you want to look at, see uh, firsthand what a rape-prone society looks like. So this gives you sort of an idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about um, rape culture. Uh, to sort of show, show you this, to sort of talk about how we sort of see this in the media, uh, in the news, and how men are portrayed and how women are portrayed, of course, both associated with sex. But I'll show you some images in a minute. When we do show them as sex, generally it's negative connotations of women with sex, positive connotations of men with sex, and also uh, women as the objects, men as the subjects in sex. So men are the ones wanting it, women the ones being wanted, uh, and uh, generally women are viewed sort of as objects um, in this sexual portrayal uh, of uh, women. The good news, this is looking at adjusted rates of rape and sexual assault of women around the world. Uh, so if it's green, uh, any of the green countries, rape is considered relatively rare. Uh, in the yellow, we're sort of in the middle, so in the United States. And these are adjusted rates of rape, because actually reported rates of rape um, are actually much higher than this. But many countries in which rape is common, it gets reported very minimally. Uh, that's one of the characteristics of a rape-prone society. Women just don't report it because they understand that they could be blamed for it uh, under these circumstances. So that's good news, is we're not as good as we could be, but we're not as bad as some places uh, around the world. So when we talk about our own culture, and some of the characteristics in our own society that are related to sort of high levels of rape. Um, of course, we find objectified images of women. We find violent macho images of men. Uh, one of the other uh, characteristics we tend to notice is I want everybody to pay attention to this in the future. When we go to movies, who tends to be the, male, the main characters in the movies we watch? 
vast majority of all the speaking roles in movies that we tend to go see. Who is it? Men, we go to movies, it's very, very common to watch a movie in which the vast majority of the entire cast are men, and of course they'll, show in, they'll throw in one sexy female, uh, sort of the token female, uh, uh, to be part of this. In fact, in the 1980s, a woman, she was actually a comic book writer, uh, developed what is called the Bechdel test, and she, it was a test to sort of see how prevalent women were in the movie. And so it passes the Bechtel test if a movie meets three criteria. The first criteria is there have to be at least two women in the movie. That's it, two women uh, that have speaking roles. The third criteria is the two women have to have a conversation with each other about something. And the third criteria is that conversation has to be about something other than a man. So that's literally the minimal standard of the Bechtel test. Two women who talk to each other about something. That's all the standard. Uh, in analysis, 90% of all popular movies don't pass the Bechtel test. Most kids' movies don't pass the Bechtel test. Uh, just pay attention to this, but most movies don't. But it's also a lot of attitudes we have about women in relationships. Uh, so the first one would be adversarial relationships, that men and women are in this competition with one each other, and who's going to win, and who's uh, going to play the game uh, the best, that relationships not are about partnerships and helping one another, but relationships are about competitions with one another. Who can hold out the longest? Who can pretend are the least interested in the other person, uh, these sorts of attitudes. Uh, another attitude, of course, women are catty, gossipy, bitchy, that women are mean girls. We even had a movie about it, didn't we, recently? Well, not recently, not for you guys, it was probably when you guys were kids. Um, and Lindsay Lohan was in it. How many people have seen the movie Lindsay Lohan? And of course, if Lindsay Lohan's in a movie, it's got to be truth, right? Uh, <laughs> So actually, a study a year ago by Pamela Orpinas out of uh, Georgia actually did a con uh, conducted a study on relational bullying of junior high and high school kids and found that boys are actually more likely to engage in relational bullying than girls are. Here's the sad truth. Boys are li more likely to engage in relational bullying, but girls are far more likely to be the victims of this sort of bullying. But yet, we tell and promote the story that women are mean, that girls are bullying, that girls are catty and bitchy and gossipy, um, that men are just fine. We ignore locker room talk, but we focus our anger, our hatred, our resentment onto young girls when they're just more likely to be the victims in these uh, circumstances. And this is an attitude we have all bought into, that girls somehow have this bad streak. Uh, uh, that women are vain, that they are selfish, these attitudes. That we have this attitude that sex is the purview of men. Sex belongs to men. Men like sex, women don't. Women want relationships. And so we somehow look at men and women completely differently. We'll talk about a little bit that uh, more uh, in a minute. But this attitude, and this was also associated with rape-prone societies, that sex is something that men score. It's a notch on their belt. It is, so did you score tonight? So we have this verbiage of men talking about sex with women as if women are property, as if they are objects to uh, manipulate, to master, to win, to accomplish, uh, these sorts of things. Uh, it, when we look at rape-free societies, however, um, sex is not considered the purview of men. Sex is not considered something only men like. Sex is really only considered as a relational aspect. Um, it's not indicative of men's prowess or any of these. It is simply a way for men and women equally to share an emotion. It's not viewed as this sort of competitive battle for men to win something or score something. Women aren't trophies or prizes uh, in rape-free societies. But we also have, and we sexualize and glorify images, essentially, of women's um, mastery or mastery over women, as in uh, uh, Star Wars. And does Star Wars, by the way, does anybody know if Star Wars passes the Bechdel test? 
Now it doesn't even come close to passing the Bechdel test. There's no, um, uh, even I think the new ones don't even pass the Bechdel test. Uh, we'll go through here a series of images that we see frequently. All of these images have been in commercials that, uh, that have been in the popular news story. Um, so this upper image, an objectified image of a woman. What's happening in this image right here? What's happening to her? That's a gang rape, yeah, and it's, it's being glorified. It's being shown as these men um, have sort of, you know, this power associated with it, and the woman obviously wants it. You know, images of highly perfected women, um, that women have to meet this um, highly sculpted image that's not even realistic. So she really is this skinny. A week after this picture was taken, she died from anorexia. She was a Brazilian model. She died one week after she um, performed in this runway model. So this ideal image that we have to make women into this image that they can't even sustain and live. I mean, it's not even uh, something that she can uh, survive with. Uh, women laying down, very objectified images of women that uh, essentially come and do what you will to me. Uh, other images of women having to look very, very beautiful, very, very sexy, that her entire existence, the only reason she exists, and the only purpose for her as a human being is to be sexually attractive for some man. That's what this message is sending to all of us. Any little girl who picks up this magazine and sees it is going to get this message. Oh, so that's what my purpose in society is. My purpose in society is to make myself sexually attractive enough for some man to want me. And what do men come to believe when they see these images? Ah, that's the role of women. Women have to make themselves hot enough for me. Women have to make themselves sexually ready enough for me uh, in order for me to want them. And so we focus on the sexualized body parts of women um, because she's clearly not good enough in this image. And only now, after she actually has some uh, breasts, uh, is, she, uh, is she much better and much happier. This one, really, really depressing. <laughs> Uh, because it's targeting teenage boys. It's a snowboarding advertisement. Uh, the evolution of men uh, and women, of course, continued to get dragged by the hair. I assume he's going up to the mountain to snowboard because he has a jacket and a hat, long sleeve pants, but she is still in a skimpy, skimpy bathing suit. So I don't know how she's going to stay warm. But of course, the message is women are just our objects that we drag along with us and use as we need. That's why they exist. That is what their purpose is. I'm assuming they're talking about a female dog, but I'm sure it's an analogy for another word as well. Uh, the only word that you can use to describe this, this is again targeting teenage boys. It's the target audience here is we're talking about teenagers. We're talking about young boys learning what their relationship to girls in their life and women in their life is going to be. This one really, really depresses me for several reasons. One, because PETA is supposed to be a progressive organization, um, but based on this alone, I'm not a big fan of theirs. Uh, but what, this is actually also sending a second message. This message is sending the idea to all of us that no part of a woman's body is not open for public scrutiny. There's not a single part of our bodies that the public is not going to talk about, scrutinize, judge, and make comments about. What this is saying is this doesn't belong to her. This is not her privacy. This is not her private body. This is ours and we get to decide, really men get to decide, um, what she is going to look like um, and what she is going to do for men. Um, and so there has been a trend in the last five to ten years of women, of course, completely waxing and shaving themselves. And guess where this trend started? Where was the beginning of this trend in the last five, ten years? Anybody know? Pornography. 
Uh, so it started with pornography. What happened is boys were seeing pornography and saying to themselves, oh, so that's how a woman is supposed to look. I'm like a prepubescent little girl. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of women are doing this, but Here's the sad thing is, women who shave themselves completely um, are more open for urinary tract infections and other sorts of infections. It essentially paves the way for women to get infections. So there has been an increase of girls and women getting uh, infections as a result of uh, trying to completely shave, trying to make themselves acceptable for the public uh, uh, statement about how they're supposed to look. This one, she's clearly an object. It's hard to tell whether she's a doll or whether she's a dead person, but either way, she doesn't get to decide for herself um, what she's going to wear. Uh, society is going to decide what she wears and how she's supposed to look. We're going to put that on. So again, this overarching message is women don't own themselves. Women aren't in control of uh, their own bodies, their own uh, lives. Um, and so sex, sexy women are used, and of course the small, big one, and of course one of these women stands out a little bit more than the rest. Love this one, a dead woman, still sexually attractive, being eaten by a shark to sell American Express. I still have yet to figure out how this sells an American Express card. <laughs> it doesn't make me go, ooh, I want to go buy American Express. Maybe I could be a dead, sexy woman uh, eaten by a shark. Um, <laughs> this one, clearly an image of pornography. Again, the message is, what is her purpose in life? What function does she serve in life? And that is, of course, to be sexually targeted. Um, and this is, of course, images of, uh, uh, images of um, rape and pornography. Uh, this one makes me really, really sad because that girl looks really, really young, doesn't she? How old? I mean, I, I don't even know if I would put her at just beginning of puberty, maybe 12, maybe 13 years old. She's really, really young. They have her shirt open. They have her highly sexualized. They have her hand on her crotch. Um, and so, of course, we watch this and think to ourselves, as a society, and endorsing an image like this, what we are all saying is, little girls are sexy. Little girls are attractive. Don't you want to have sex with a little girl? Uh, and that's really the image uh, that this uh, projects. American apparel, although I don't see any apparel. <laughs> that part is missing, so I can't decide if I want to buy the outfit or not. Um, but again, a young girl, um, highly sexualized. Really, the point is um, that her purpose, her function in society um, uh, is to be sexually um, uh, attacked. And so how does this um, leave us? I've got a couple of YouTube um, videos to watch before we move into the other topics. This one... Serge's Spain sounds like a nagging wife on TV today. Not even married yet. <laughs> Julie DeCaro is a run of the mill, mediocre B writer. Not atrocious, not good, just sort of there. I'm actually not a B writer at all, but okay. <laughs> Sarah Spain is just a scrub muffin. I don't even know what a scrub muffin is. I don't either. I love muffins. One of the players should beat you to death with their hockey stick, like before you are. I'm just reading this. Okay. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> okay, uh, this is why we don't hire any females unless we need, uh... Unless we need our sucked or our food cooked. Sarah Spain is a self-important know-it-all. Dumb. There's a lot of C words. There's a lot of C words. Yeah. 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 I hope you're
your dog gets hit by a car, you... Hopefully this gang, Julie DeCaro, is Billy Co Bill Cosby's next victim. That would be a classic. And I would say that. I don't. firing back at critics who said you can't get any? That's something, huh? Sorry. Uh, okay. So I, I, ha I have to read all of them, right? Because I mean... Um, read them, I guess. Uh, I hope you get raped again. Oh. So that highlights, there's actually even a word for that, women online. Um, there's phrases to talk about, uh, what women uh, uh, see there. How, and here's, a, here's a, just for fun, uh, another couple of actually music videos. I'm only going to show you a few seconds of the first one. How many people have seen the original video of uh, Blurred Lines? Has anybody seen? All right, for those of you who haven't, it's a little R-rated or um, to so. Bigot, shut up. Every bigot, shut up. Roles, trying to put misogyny on parole. Exploitation. 
Nation on probation Time for you to witness our liberation There's more to life than penetration And sexual discrimination So tonight we ignite our civil rights Resist chauvinism, win the fight Cause you live in large, just like a montage Of you and your friends acting out entourage But we ain't hoes to do your household chores To make you a sandwich when we're on all fours From history to history Know you got some opinions that we don't agree Need to call my sister, join the AIC A bigger feminist cake, Antoinette Marie She gotta drop the size. You want a box cap? Show me a six pack. You want a landing strip? You better get ripped. I apologize if you think my lines are crass. Tell me how it feels to get verbally harassed. This man's world with all its bullshit. Girls don't deserve it, and that's why we quit. We ain't good girls. We ask scholastic. good sports for that <laughs> <laughs> but again we get lots and lots and lots of videos where it's the other way around and it's women uh, in these videos uh, so some of the characteristics that we see in a rape prone society is probably something we're probably all familiar with uh, and that is slut shaming this is how we control women's sexuality. And make no mistake about it, the control of women's sexuality is how we control uh, the power of women. Uh, and so in, if we look at actually any way that somebody wants to control another person or control a group of people, it's control their sexuality. Uh, and so it's no surprise then, some of the countries that are the most rape prone, Middle Eastern, North African nations, uh, they engage in what is called female genital mutilation. How many people are familiar with this? Uh, this is where they literally go in and to varying degrees literally cut off uh, using uh, knives, um, uh, blades, other forms. Uh, girls as young as three years old, generally up through uh, the beginning of puberty, they literally cut off their clitoris. Um, so they do major damage and then they sew the girls up. There is about a one in four death rate of associated with uh, young girls. This happens to, they die either from infection or they die from hemorrhaging. Literally, they bleed to death as the number one cause of death. Uh, and so they do this and a woman, a girl who has not had this done is considered sexually dirty. She's considered disgusting and nasty. So all all mothers, of course, want their girls to have this done. This is how you protect their reputations. And so to control her sexuality is to control her, to control what she can do with her own body is the strongest way of imprisoning a person. We put them in prison when we don't allow people to do what they want with their own bodies. Now in the United States and other rape prone cultures, the United States, we don't uh, 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 engage in female genital mutilation, but what we do is the same. We don't mutilate their bodies, instead we mutilate mutilate their reputations about sex. But the outcome is exactly the same. We are doing the same thing to women. We may not be targeting their bodies, but we're targeting their reputations. But the outcome is still, we're going to control their sexuality. We get to decide as a society what we think they are allowed to do with their bodies. We're going to judge, we're going to scrutinize. We are going to judge their self-worth as a human being uh, based on this. And so if you control a woman in sexuality, her, uh, her sexuality, you control her. And if you control her, you can control patriarchy. This control of women's reputations is how we limit women's power in society. It is how we control them. Uh, and so what are, the, of course, the horrible things women do to be slut shamed in our society? Uh, girls who have the audacity to begin puberty 
Yes, we slut shame girls for doing that. Uh, starting puberty, growing breasts, uh, getting a period, uh, and girls are often generally targeted and attacked, particularly if they start at younger ages or if they show any signs um, of this uh, development. So any woman, of course, who shows any hint of sexuality is going to be slut-shamed. Uh, girls who have been raped are slut-shamed. In the Steubenville case, the, the, the victim was highly slut-shamed. These are examples of three women who were uh, targeted and slut-shamed in the media uh, uh, Sandra Fluke down here, and guess what horrible thing she did to be slut shamed? She spoke out for birth control, access to birth control for women. Yes, she did a congressional hearing and said that women need access to birth control, not just to control, uh, not just to control, of course, pregnancy, but to control other medical issues as well. And uh, she was, of course, called a slut. Uh, Cheryl Sandberg, guess what a horrible thing she did to be slut-shamed. She started dating again after her husband died. Uh, so very recently, she started dating again, this man here, and so she has been targeted in the media as a slut for dating again. Of course, the uh, message is that she was the property of her husband, and so she doesn't have free will and free right to date again. Uh, Elizabeth, um, Ashley Judd, I don't have a picture of her, but she commented on a basketball game and said the other team was playing dirty. That's all she said. And she was targeted quite actually viciously um, in the news. And this is Elizabeth Smart now. Um, I don't know if any of you guys uh, uh, are familiar with her case, but when she was a young girl, she was kidnapped from her home, held hostage, uh, and uh, forced into marriage, and was repeatedly raped over several months before she was finally rescued. And she was slut-shamed for many reasons. Um, one, why didn't she just voluntarily leave? They didn't see her as a kidnapped victim. Uh, and because she was, of course, no longer a virgin. Uh, and she's actually spoken out recently uh, and publicly spoken out out that says that we need to quit tying women's self-worth to their chastity. We need to stop tying the value of a woman to essentially her sexual uh, experiences. Uh, so what does this slut shaming sort of promote? It promotes this, of course, idea that the ideal woman is a pure woman. The ideal woman is not having any sex. She's saving herself for only one man who gets to have possession of her. He gets to control her sexually exclusively. Uh, and that's really the message uh, that we are um, uh, sending, that women are these objects belonging to men who get to control their sexuality rather than them getting to decide and control their sexuality. So in all of the ways that we promote this idea in our society, one is exists in religious doctrine. So of course, religious uh, doctrine will say that, of course, the ideal woman should stay a virgin until her wedding day in which she is then the property of a man. It exists in our cultural expectations. There was even a movie about this. Anybody see the movie, What's Your Number? Uh, and it means different things for men and women, doesn't it? If a woman are asked, what's your number, does anybody know, what are we talking about here? Your phone number, how can I get a hold of you? What does it mean? Yes, essentially how many people you've slept with. And we use this to judge women, to put them into categories. Women you can take home to parents and women you can't. Women who deserve to be uh, chastised and slut-shamed and publicly humiliated uh, and women who don't deserve this. And of course, this is a very impossible standard uh, to meet. There are even scientific theories that promote uh, this particular idea. Uh, so how many people have heard the idea that uh, men want to spread their DNA? So men are biologically wired to want to have sex with a lot of people. That's how they're built. Men want to go spread their DNA. It's their mating strategy. Women, however, don't want to be, have a lot of partners. They want to pick one partner and have them committed and uh, have them devoted to their child rearing. So there's even a scientific theory that argues essentially men like sex and women don't. Uh, and so this would be, if this theory were 
true, it would make us pretty much the only species on the planet where males uh, on the planet where males and females have a completely different reproductive strategy. Would be the only species on the planet for this uh, to happen. Uh, but all of these ideas are extremely destructive because they're reinforcing the idea that the ideal woman, the right kind of woman, the perfect woman, isn't having any sex. The ideal woman is, uh, is um, chaste for all purposes. So uh, men go to women for sex. Women are just passive there uh, about sex. Women don't go to men for sex. So essentially, sex is owned by men. And when sex is owned by men, men get to control when it happens, where it happens, how it happens, with whom it happens, which is, of course, what leads to situations in which rape can be justified. Uh, however, interestingly enough, the scientific theory has been uh, debunked in, a lot of, uh, in some research conducted only in the last couple of years. Uh, this uh, particular study by Dr. Kimberly Russell was really, really interesting, actually. They brought a whole group of men and women into the lab, and they wired them up to measure blood flow, if you know what I mean. So essentially, <laughs> to measure blood flow and arousal uh, on their bodies, and then they showed them images. They showed them videos of heterosexual sex, uh, gay men having sex, gay women having sex, and even bonobo sex. So bonobos, chimpanzees, versions of chimpanzees. And what they found was really, really interesting. Men would get turned on uh, by heterosexual sex if they were straight, gay sex if they were gay, and when they got turned on, they said, yes, I'm aroused right now. So they verbally indicated correctly um, when they were aroused. It got more interesting with women, however. Women became aroused when they watched any of it. Gay, gay sex, straight sex, even bonobo sex. Women became aroused. But here's the interesting thing. They didn't indicate that they were verbally. They only indicated that they were aroused when they watched heterosexual sex. So essentially, women were lying. Women were saying, no, it doesn't do anything to me. And clearly, it was. Um, so what this research showed is that we have culturally ingrained in women this idea of ignore your own sexuality because it doesn't belong to you. It's not something you get to decide when you're going to be aroused. If you do get aroused, you know what it means we're going to think of you. We're going to think you're a slut. We're going to think something's wrong with you. So women were not being honest about um, this. And it's really interesting. Women may have actually learned not to even recognize their um, own sexuality. Uh, and this study was actually really interesting. Many of you guys may have uh, watched this study in a psychology because it tends to be uh, uh, the pivotal study to demonstrate that men like sex and women don't was they had random men uh, walk around campus and walk up to, to stranger women and said and just say to them uh, would you like to go have sex with me and then they had a woman doing the same thing a woman walking around campus walking up to random men and saying would you like to go have sex with me and the study was actually really fascinating it was repeated many times but virtually every time you do the study when the men walked up to a woman and said would you like to have sex with me the woman looked at them and goes dude no uh, and whenever the woman however walked up to men the men were like yeah, okay, <laughs> sure, <laughs> uh, you want to go right now? Uh, so men were much more likely to say sure. Uh, and so uh, a study in 2015 decided to challenge these results. And he argued that women are not saying no because it's not something they want. They're saying no because, one, they're afraid of the reputations and what it's going to do to them uh, in terms of slut shaming. And two, they're saying no because they may be at higher uh, fear of their safety. So they're worried that if they do go off with a man, they could be hurt, they could be murdered, something very bad could happen to them. So uh, these researchers actually were pretty genius. What they did was they brought 165 people into a lab, some of them men, some of them women, and they showed them pictures of people and said, some of these people in these pictures have seen your picture and they would either like to be in a relationship with you, so like to meet you, to date you, or they would like to meet you for casual sex. And then 
they were told in the study, like, okay, you're allowed to pick any one of these people you want. So men were allowed to pick, women were allowed to pick. And if you decide to go on a date with them, we'll videotape the first 30 minutes of the date so you feel safe and we won't leave for the first 30 minutes. So if you don't feel safe, you can leave. And what they found was women, of course, now they didn't have to worry about public shaming. They didn't have to worry about safety. They controlled for those two aspects. And they found that women were just as likely uh, to say, yeah, I'll go with the casual sex guy, <laughs> as the women, as the men were to say, I'll go with the casual sex woman. And so these studies really call into question that particular research argument that sex is something men want, it is not something women want. Uh, but uh, there was a, a book published recently going through all of this research, and I, I, he was posed the question, then why do we think that sex really is just something only about men, where men are going after, men want, and women don't want it, of course, which sets up. When we have this attitude, when we have this belief that men want it, women don't. So you kind of have to go after it. You have to pressure her. You have to do something to get her to want it because she's not biologically prepared to want it. And this is what he argued. If you can effectively intervene with cultural rules and expectations and thus control the decision-making process involved in female choice, because this is what it is. What we're doing is we're limiting female choice choice on what they want, control whether desire leads to sex, you essentially get control of reproduction. And who controls paternity controls the world. Put another way, if you have a culture that convinces women that they are less interested in sex than men, that they are more interested in monogamy, then you create a situation whereby women learn to ignore or dis disregard their own physical arousal, particularly in situations that are deemed inappropriate. Of course, other cultural mechanisms work to reinforce this through slut shaming and even physical punishment. So essentially, our rape culture is a way that we control women's sexuality. And we do this by convincing women that they don't really want it, and convincing men, women don't really want it, so you have to go after it a little bit harder. What if instead we lived in a world where boys were not taught, you know what, girls may resist, you're going to have to pressure her a little bit, you're going to have to convince her this is what we want. But instead, boys were taught, dude, if she wants it, she'll let you know. <laughs> there will be no mistaking it. You don't have to pressure her. She'll let you know whether she wants it. But that's not the message we send. We send the message that, oh, no, girls don't want it. You've got to go after it. You've got to be a little bit more aggressive with women because we have this assumption that they are not uh, themselves. So when we want to control a group of people, we control them through their sexuality. Uh, another... Uh, element that we've actually been seeing in the last few years is how many people in here have heard of revenge porn? Is anybody in here of revenge porn? This is another example of essentially how we control women's bodies and women's sexuality. Uh, and so there have actually been huge trends. This is actually a picture of a woman who's uh, getting a law degree for the sole purpose of protecting women and going after men who are posting revenge porns of women. So essentially what this is, is a couple is together and nude photos may be shared. And what happens is, after the breakup, in order to punish her, control her, what men are doing is putting those pictures up publicly on the, um, uh, online, even putting them on um, uh, websites, directing people to go to her house, telling her she wants it. Oh, and if she resists, it's all a game. Go after her anyways. And so women have been uh, lost jobs as a result of this. In Italy, uh, very recently, there was a case of a woman it was fighting in courts for over a year for the, um, the videos, actually, her boyfriend took of her when they were together. And about a year ago, she actually committed suicide because it was getting so impossible for her to remove any of those images uh, from the internet. So this has really destroyed a lot of women's lives. Uh, in the last six months, how many people heard of the Marines United situation? 
got a couple people here. Uh, and this was literally public sites. Well, you had to be invited into the site. So you could only get into the website by being invited in. But it was essentially men posting compromising pictures of women, either nude pictures of them that they happened to get a hold of, or targeting women and getting nude pictures of them, and then posting them on these sites uh, where they were distributing these images and men were going to without the women's permission. So the women didn't have permission, uh, uh, didn't give permission for their images to be uh, posted on the site. And there were thousands of images posted. The military did find out about the website and shut it down. And guess what happened immediately afterwards? A second site cropped up. Um, and they shut that one down. And a second one and a third one cropped up right after that. It didn't matter what they crushed down. They would just create another site. Um, so this was essentially women without giving permission uh, who their uh, compromising images were, were posted uh, online. Uh, when we talk about how women are portrayed in the media uh, uh, or silenced in the media as we're talking. Uh, uh, and really what we're, we're saying here when we look at some of these statistics is what we're really saying is that women we want to see. Women should be seen and they shouldn't be heard. We don't want to hear what they have to say. We don't want to listen to the intellectual side of them. We don't value women's intellectual contributions. We really only value their sexual contributions. We only want to look at them in very sexy ways. We don't want to uh, listen to them. So it's sort of this idea that the ideal woman is a quiet, silent woman who sits at home naked on the bed, you know, just waiting for us uh, to, to come and you know, attack her. Uh, but if we look at, uh, at women in the media, uh, only about 30% of speaking characters in movies are women. So only about 30% of speaking roles in movies and television are of women. Uh, and of those women, about 28, about 29% of them were in revealing or sexy clothes at some point, so almost a third, as opposed to only 7% of men in movies and media who were in sexually revealing uh, clothes. 26% uh, of all female actors have to get partially naked at some point, and this is only true of about 9% of male actors. Uh, and the number, the percentage of movies in which there's a balanced cast, meaning there's an equal number of female uh, actresses as there are male actresses, is only about 10% of all movies that we go and watch. Only about 10% has an equal uh, division there. And here's the interesting thing. If a movie does have a lot of female characters, what do we call it? We call it a chick flick. We give it a degrading name, um, an insulting name, and we call it a chick flick. And then it's, of course, not a movie that men want to go see. It's only a movie uh, women will go see. But really, the overarching message here is we really don't want to listen to what women have to say. We really don't want to hear what they have to um, uh, talk about. That's not what we're interested in. Uh, and, of course, the last issue that we have to address is women in leadership positions uh, or women in politics. So this is a global map, and the darker the color, uh, the uh, higher there is in uh, percentage of women in parliament. Uh, so in the United States, we're a light blue, so about 20%. Uh, only about 20% of all women in uh, political positions, or I should say only about 20% of all political positions are held by women in the United States. Um, uh, interestingly enough, we're still one of uh, uh, several, but there have been a lot of countries to beat us, but we're one of um, a handful of countries in the world that have never had a female head of state. So we've never achieved that milestone. Even Iran, interestingly enough, has achieved that milestone. Uh, and many African countries have achieved that milestone. Many South American countries have achieved that milestone. But the United States, as of yet, has still never had uh, a female uh, head of state. It's still not something we can stomach. It's still not something we're culturally uh, ready for. So to summarize, uh, all of this, sort of all of these issues that we contribute to, we allow to happen, we even contribute, um, we uh, allow to happen, is 
we make women's sexuality something that's highly monitored and highly regulated in our culture. We really do make judgments about women based on their sexuality, but we don't judge men based on their sexuality. So for women, it is something that they have to guard very, very personally, very, very privately, because they know they could be judged for jobs, they could be judged for relationships, they could be judged for all sorts of characteristics based on what they have done sexu uh, sexually, but men are not. And so this is how we limit women's expression uh, in society. Uh, images of uh, ideal women that are highly sexualized, we should see tons and tons of images every single day from young girls, uh, see images all the time of highly sexualized women uh, learning that, oh, I guess that's what I'm supposed to look like. I guess that's how I'm supposed to behave. Um, and the not so subtle images that women's bodies are public property. So if a woman is not doing with their body what we think is appropriate, we're going to judge it, scrutinize it, criticize it, uh, and make sure that they conform, make sure they lose enough weight and that they're thin enough, make sure they shave all their body parts just the right way, the way we've decided that they should, that they haven't had more sex than we say that they're allowed to want or have, that we treat women's bodies as if they are public property, but we treat men's bodies like they're personal, like men Men get to decide these things for themselves. We're not judging them, but we are judging women. We engage in slut-shaming, which is, of course, the same as female ge um, genital mutilation. We are mutilating their reputations and controlling their sexuality through revenge porn, uh, not having enough women in leadership positions. Uh, and we silence women in the media. We're giving all women the message, the ideal woman the perfect woman is to be quiet, to sit and be supportive of your um, husband or your boyfriend, not say too much, not be too opinionated, not have too many fancy ideas and all, um, but to be uh, seen and not heard. Just sit back quietly in the background and be sexy and try to get somebody to be attracted to you at some point. That's really your goal in life. And this overarching message that links all of this together is that sex belongs to men. Sex is something that men own. Sex is something that men get to control. It's done to women. Women aren't the objects in it. Women are the subjects. And when we all buy into an attitude that sex is something men own and men control, we create a climate in which rape is going to happen. Child molestation is going to happen. Women are going to experience these things. All right, that is all.